your Bibles, Philippians, Philippians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3. Got some work uh, we're going to do here, and I, uh, I, I'm going to mention other passages. I'm not going to have you turn there because I uh, want to try to get done with this sermon within the next hour and a half or two. And so, uh, anyway, <laughs> that's it. You people are going, oh, yeah, yeah, preach, preach it, let her go. Well, uh, some other guys are going, oh, I came to the wrong place. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, and we're really, really glad you're here. Uh, Brother King, you know, I'm, I'm preaching first. Uh, Brother Folger is going to be after me in a little bit. And we're talking about the time. It's Friday night. And Brother King just said this, here's what I really want. I just want God to get a hold of us. That's what we want. We're not looking to just stay on a schedule, although we have one, but that's not our goal. Our goal is get a hold of us, God. And we're not the same. And his preached word can do that. He's done it many, many times. Philippians chapter 3, if you're able, I ask you to stand with me, please. I ask people to stand to remind us to give reverence and to give honor to the eternal, infallible, inerrant, perfect, preserved word of the living God. We're giving honor to God's word. We're just going to, I'm going to be working on this passage uh, each time I speak, but if you look at verse 20 is where we're going to just jump in. For our, verse 20, for our conversation, and that's actually, it's not talking just about what you say, um, and a bigger view of that would be, it's our life. Another way that one of the Greek words, the way the Greek definition, one of the guys say anyway, it's like a citizenship. It's we're part of this citizenship. It's who we are. He said, look what he says, for our conversation, our citizenship is in heaven. Somebody ought to say amen. That's where I'm going. That's my home. I'm just passing through here. I don't, I don't really don't live here. I'm just kind of passing through. My citizenship's in heaven. And it says, from whence, from heaven, that's where, whence, also <laughs> we look for the Savior. Amen. Well, who is he? Well, he is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That's who I'm looking for him. I'm not preaching on the second coming, but I'd like to. <laughs> but he's coming back. Yeah. Yeah. Right. My citizenship's there. And there I'm looking for the Savior. And his name is the Lord Jesus Christ. But the next verse, here it is. Who, Jesus, who shall change our vile bodies that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. I'm just telling you, he's able. This passage is talking about the second coming. That's that little box there. And when he comes, he's going to change us. We're not going to heaven like this. We get a new body, like his body. And so he's able to subdue all things unto himself. That's going to be evident, and that's, that's going to take place in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. But I'm going to uh, stretch this, and hopefully we're going to get to see more than just that moment when we see him. So uh, I'm going to ask you to be seated. When it says he's able to subdue all things, it is looking forward to when he comes. 
But I just want to go ahead and let you know, or just remind you, he doesn't have to wait till he comes back that he'd be able to subdue all things. He's able to subdue all things right now. In fact, when he walked on the planet, he said, all power is given unto me. So he's got all the power. And then he said, well, in heaven, I got all the power. Well, I got it in earth too. He's got all power. So he's able to subdue all things. So we're not waiting for him to come back to see if he can subdue all things. He already is able to do that. Praise his name. To subdue something, to subdue it. Let's just go ahead and do this. When you subdue something, you get, you get something, whatever it is, to yield, to give in, to surrender. You bring it under control. It's no longer in control. You're in control of that. You're able to subdue all things, to bring it under its power or authority. Jesus has all power and all authority, and he's able to bring all things, subdue all things unto himself right now. Somebody please agree with that. Say amen. <laughs> Pastor Lori Reed, uh, he gave me some help on this definition some months ago. He said, subdue is that you take, a pow you take power away from any other thing or person. To subdue them, you take power away from that thing or that person that stands in opposition to the desired result. Yeah. So there's a, there's a desire that we should have for Jesus Christ. Amen. If he's able to subdue all things, he's able to take the power away from all things or persons and allow us, because it stands in opposition to the desired result. And tonight, I, I don't title my sermons, but one of the things we could call this, what is the desired result? What, what is that? Well, that's the work we're going to do. So, sorry about this. I'm going to, I'm not sorry, but I'm, I, anyway, I'm going to preach out of chapter 3. I'm going to mention these other verses. We're not going to turn there. If you want to write them down, great for you. If you want to wait and buy the video, $29.99. If you want to, but anyway, uh, you can get a, some kind of copy of it. Here we go. <clears throat> so let's look at the context when he gets to verse 21. We're going to start in verse 4. He says, though... This is Paul talking to the Philippians. He says, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof, he might trust in the flesh. Well, I more. Let's just stop. Paul is explaining to the Philippians. He's saying, hey, you, if, you th if you think you're going to have confidence in your flesh, that you're going to please God, and you're going to attain to what we're trying to do, he said, you're, you're, you're out of your mind. If you think you have confidence... I, if you want to talk about it, I more. I could have more confidence than you guys. And then he talks about being a Pharisee. He talks about being circumcised. He talks about being of the tribe of Benjamin. He talks about that he's blameless under the law. And he, he says all of those things, but he says all of those things became unimportant. All of the, my history, my religion, my past, all the things that I've done, and here, the, the most remarkable one, in my opinion, of, of the text there is he's blameless. Under the law, he's blameless. I don't, I've never met that person that I could say, uh, they're blameless. But Paul says it out loud to the Philippians. He says, hey, you want to try to find me guilty in the law somewhere? You're not going to be able to do it. He said, if you want to trust in what you do, your religion and all your activity, I could trust more in my own. But he said, these things are unimportant to me. Look at verse 7. He said, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss, but for a reason, for Christ. He said, all these things that were powerful and important to me, I just erased those or I removed those from me. Why? I counted them loss. Why? Uh, for Christ. 
I want him. Look at verse 8. The end of verse 8, he says, and I do count them but dung. All these things, he said, I consider them to be waste. I consider them to be unimportant. They're, I count them but dung. Why, 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 why? Look at the last few words of verse 8. That I may win Christ. Paul says, all these other things out here and all this activity that I've ever done in my life, if you want to brag about your religion, you want to brag about what you've done, I could brag more. But he said, all of that bragging that we could do, all that bragging is useless. In fact, it's like waste. It's done. Why? Duh, that I may win Christ. I want Christ more than all this recognition. Mm. Uh, come with me, verse 9. He says, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, but the righteousness which is found by faith in Jesus Christ. Paul says, I want to be found in him. I don't want to be found in my own righteousness. He said, my righteousness, all of my religion, all of my activity, all my goodnesses, all my righteousness. He said, mm, I don't want to be found in that. I want to be found in the righteousness that's in him. What kind of righteousness does he have? Well, I'd say perfect, pure, holy, he is the righteousness of God, and the righteousness of God is in him. And Paul says, I don't want my righteousness. Whoa, 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 listen to me. When he comes, when he comes, I don't want to be found in my righteousness, my goodnesses. I want his righteousness. Listen, fellas, our righteousnesses are useless. They are filthy rags. And we could do the description of those, but I'm just telling you, they're worthless. I don't, want my, I don't want my righteousness. I want His righteousness. Oh. Verse 14. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Yes, Lord. <laughs> Thy servant here. That might remind people to turn your things off. When he says, I press toward the mark. Do you understand, do you have enough awareness that means he's not there yet? He doesn't say, I've obtained the mark. He said, I'm pressing. Since you brought it up, I'll just say it quickly. Press sounds like effort. Sounds like someone needs to make a decision. If you're going to press, Paul the Apostle said, I press toward the mark. And we're going, yes, praise God. The prize, yes, amen. The high calling of God, yes, that's a hallelujah. Yes, that's so awesome. He's not there yet. What is the mark? I press toward the mark. What is that mark? Well, it's the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Yeah, that's kind of an overview of it. That's a heading. This mark, it's a calling of God that he's given the Apostle Paul. No, I'll say it like this. He's given anybody who says they're a believer. Yeah. Yeah. If you say tonight, if you say you're a believer, he's given you a high calling. Paul said he's given us a high calling of God. 
in Christ Jesus. Well, whatever that mark is, he has not attained it. It's still in front of him. Look, look at verse number 12. <clears throat> not as though I had already attained, either or already perfect, but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Whatever it is, he has not apprehended it yet. Somebody say amen. amen. What's he trying to apprehend, though? Well, the mark. Oh, he's pressing toward the mark. What is the mark that he's trying to apprehend? What is he trying to attain? What is it? Well, in my opinion, and it's only my commentary, no, I never didn't anybody else tell me this, but I think it's verse 10. Verse 10 says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. What is he trying to attain? What is it? What mark? What's the prize? He says, I want to know him. When he says know him, and the way I view this, it's threefold things that he's trying to know. Now, wait, 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 stop, stop, stop. He's not saying, I want to know for sure I'm saved. He already knows he's saved. When he says, I want to know him, he's not talking about, I want to know for sure that I'm saved. He already knows it's real. What he's saying is that, I want to know him deeply. I want to know him intimately. I don't want to just know about him. I want to know him. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? You, you fellows that are married, when you first got married, you thought, I know her. This is so good. She married me. I know her. And then you get, after two years ago, I don't know her. I thought I knowed her. I don't know her anymore. I've been married 45 years and I'm still learning her. But I'm guaranteeing you this, Bubba. When I got married, I loved her with all I knew about love. And I thought I knew her. And after 10 years, I went, oh, now I know her. And after 20 years, I went, oh. I know her. 30 years, everybody with me? My knowing her is, it's deeper than it's ever been. I know, I know, I know, I know some of you do this as you're married and life goes by. You're not doing this. And that's a whole other sermon, but I'm telling you, you can know her intimately. I know Nancy so well. I'm serious. We can have an argument and never say anything out loud. <laughs> I'm saying it could last 15 minutes. We never said a word. And I usually win those. <laughs> Paul wants to know him. And I say there's a threefold knowing. It tells you in the verse here, verse 10. He said, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. Wow. I, I don't know how. I've struggled and I'm, I feel so inadequate to say, hey, fellas, one of the things we need to try to attain, one of the things that we need to press toward the mark, one of the things that we need to know the power of his resurrection. I'm thinking, what's the power of his resurrection? Well, it's the most powerful thing that's ever happened on this planet. There's nothing that, can, there's nothing that comes close to the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ over sin, death, hell. 
hell and the grave. It's his power that validates everything about him. The power of the resurrection over Satan. Satan doesn't have a chance. He's a whipped mosquito. Nothing. Over sin, sin hath no more dominion over him. Sin can't touch him. And he destroyed the power of sin. The power of the resurrection, listen to this verse, what it accomplishes in all. Of, if you're a believer, and if you're not a believer, we want you to be. But listen to what it says in Romans. Let's listen to it, 425. Jesus was delivered for our offenses. Somebody say amen. He was delivered because of our sin, our offenses, and was raised again. The resurrection power was raised again for our offenses justification. Justification. We like to describe it as just as if I never sinned. That's incredible that God would look down at some goober like this and say, he's justified. Yeah. Yeah. What do you mean? It's justified. What do you mean? It's just like he's never sinned. He's clean, he's pure, he's perfect, he's holy, he's justified. No, 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 I didn't get justified because of me. I got justified because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Our justification is not dependent upon how good we are, how religious we are, whether or not we attend church, whether or not we read the Bible. Our justification is upon Jesus. He raised from the dead. That's great power. Paul says, I want to know. I want to know the power of his resurrection. I don't want to know about it. I want to know it in my life. Mercy. I don't know if you heard this a while ago, but he says, I'm pressing toward it. I've not, I've not apprehended it yet, but I'm trying. Is anybody hearing me? Hey, just stop it, cry, baby. You're sitting here going, well, I don't think we can do it. <laughs> well, I think we're supposed to press. Yeah. Oh, no, no, I don't want that kind of religion. I want it where it's all easy. Cotton candy, chocolate cake, oh, yeah. I don't want to, like, sweat. I don't want to, like, have to pray. Read my Bible. Go to church all the time? Yuck. I ain't looking for that. And that's the problem. Uh, I, I wish, I don't, I'm, I don't know how to say it. I'm just going to say these words. The power of his resurrection is victory over sin. And Paul says, I want, to, I want to know that. I don't want to know about it. I want to live it. He said also, I want to know him and the fellowship of his sufferings. Wow. When I have stuff like this that I see in the Bible... I, even I study and I spend time trying to figure it out. I'm going, I am so unable to do this. Fellowship. It's like I'm part of it. I'm kind of like involved in it. If you're not in fellowship and you're just standing back and looking over there, Say, man, some of them Christians are serious. Yeah. Is Jesus the suffering Savior? Yes. Isaiah describes his suffering, crucifixion, 
another in Isaiah it says his his visage was marred more than any man. When we say beat to a pulp, we still even can't define it. He is just a bloody piece of meat with some eyeballs stuck in there somewhere. And I can't fathom that. The suffering Savior, when we talk about the crucifixion, it's heinous. It's horrific. Like indescribable. He is the suffering Savior. Is it possible? Can we know the fellowship of his sufferings? Are we going to have to be crucified physically to know it? I think only one crucifixion was ever satisfactory. And it was enough. It paid in full. Amen. Well, what, what, what would it be that I would be the fellowship of his sufferings? Well, the Bible does say we're supposed to t- 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 take up our cross. Oh. No, 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 no. If you're a believer, you're supposed to, no, no, if you're a follower of Christ, take up your cross. Well, that sounds uncomfortable. Well, it is. Well, that's why I don't do it. You're right. But Paul says, he said, I'm trying to. I'm trying to attain that. I'm trying to reach that. I'm trying to apprehend that. The fellowship of his sufferings. Wait, wait, wait. Do you know the fellowship of his sufferings is not, it, all of his suffering didn't just take place on Calvary. He had suffering before that. Yeah. They hated Jesus. They hated him. He said, Jesus said, they hate both me and my father. They hate me without cause. The persecution of Jesus was throughout his earthly ministry. They were hounding him, barking at him, biting at him, trying to uh, defile him or demean him. They're trying to pull him down. Is everybody with me? It wasn't like, well, let's, we'll try it again next month. They were constantly trying to bring him down. Hmm. They have persecuted me, Christ says. So just a little note I just want you to be aware of in the book of Hebrews it says that Jesus learned, yeah, this is fascinating that it says it like that, he learned obedience. Isn't that weird? He's God. He's the Son of God. He's deity. Yes, he's 100% God. Somebody say amen. amen. But he's also 100% man. And the scripture says he learned obedience. And here's how the scripture says it. By the things which he suffered. I don't know if you're getting this or not. If we're going to attain the fellowship of his sufferings, we're going to have to be willing to take up our cross and whatever persecution. Jesus said, if the world hate you, know that it hated me before it did you. I don't know if you get that or not. That means they're going to hate you. They're not going to applaud you going, you are awesome. They're going to, you're idiots, you're morons. What do you mean you believe in a creation? What is that about? (laughs) You probably don't believe in climate change either. (laughs) You're a moron. Excuse me, persecution is real. And us that live here are thankful we don't have to suffer persecution like they do in India. Yeah. 
the fellowship of his sufferings? No, 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 no. Am I willing to stand for Christ and know the resurrection, his power of his resurrection, and be willing the fellowship of his sufferings that I might be, learn obedience? Guys, are you hearing that? Whatever pain and discomfort and disappointment you have in your life, he's not unaware. He knows about it. And often he'll use those very things to try to get your attention. And then if you have Paul's heart that you're trying to attain and apprehend the prize, if you're going after that, fellowship of his sufferings takes place. It's part of it. Don't push it away. Don't run from it. Doesn't mean you have to go looking for it. But it's a reality. I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. I want to know the fellowship of his resurrection. He says, I want to know, I want to be made, being made conformable unto his death. Whoa. I like the resurrection part better. <laughs> the fellowship of his suffering, that's uncomfortable. Now he says, hey, Bubba, I'm trying to attain, I'm trying to apprehend to be made conformable unto his death. Wow. I don't know if you know this or not, but Galatians says it like this, they that are Christ, if you belong to Christ, they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. Oh, mercy. If I'm going to apprehend and attain for that which I'm apprehended, I'm pressing toward the mark. I want to reach the prize. Oh, part of that includes that I want to know him and be made conformable unto his death. I don't know if you're getting this or not. Fellows, we got to be willing to die. The hardest thing we do is die. We don't want to die. Our flesh does not want to die. Our flesh will fight that. Our flesh wants its own way. Yeah. We do. It's a true saying. We die hard. We don't want to. Paul says it like this. God forbid that I should glory, save, or accept in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, any attainment, any prize, any mark that I am getting closer to, I'm not going to glory in me. I'm going to glory in the, here's how it says, in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now listen to the rest of the verse. By whom the world is crucified unto me. Paul says, as I reach and I try to attain and I'm pressing toward the mark, he said, I'm trying to be made conformable to his death. The world is crucified unto me. I'm not glorying in me, but this world has no luring for me. I am not attracted to the world. Why? Because of the cross of Jesus. The world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. I love the idea that the world's crucified unto me. You're dead. You, I don't want you. I don't want to have any part of you. But then the Bible says, hey, Bubba, you, you have to be dead to the world. Right. And the world draws its tentacles out and it's pulling on you and it's trying to tempt you and lure you and it's trying to pull on you. You go, too bad for you. I'm dead. I'm going after Christ. Yeah, amen. amen. Ooh, I don't know if anybody heard a while ago, but you have to kind of press. Yeah. Wow. What's the goal in knowing? What is the goal? Look at verse 11. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Wow. 
what's my goal in knowing? So I'll be a super Christian. Everybody go, whoa, look at him. He's a super Christian. He's the best man in the church. Wow. Uh, no. That's not the goal. The goal is that we might attain to what? The resurrection. I don't ever get this or not. I just spent time saying the world's dead to me and I'm dead to the world. But here's what I'm trying to attain. <laughs> the resurrection. I want to live in the resurrected power of Jesus Christ. I want to know the power of his resurrection is that I'm not just, the world's not just dead to me and I'm dead to the world, but I am now living the life. I'm living a resurrected life. I'm living a life that does honor and glorify and magnify him. I am pressing, I'm pressing, I'm pressing to reach that goal. It's a goal of mine. Excuse me, friend. It's not unattainable. He does not ask us to do something that's impossible for us to do. Hmm. Okay, uh, a famous or well-known verse among some of us is, I am crucified with Christ. Amen? Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. But Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen? Ooh. I don't know if you're getting this or not. That's factual. Do you know that's already happened? I've been planted together in the likeness of his death. When did that happen? When I trusted Christ. Did I know that happened? No. And there's many people who have been saved a long time and they didn't know that happened. But the moment you got saved, you died with him. But you not only died with him, you also raised with him to walk in newness of life. It's a fact it's already taken place. To live the crucified life is to live the resurrected life. Aren't we called uh, Christians? We're supposed to be like Christ. It doesn't, it doesn't, let me just, the scripture says, uh, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Somebody say amen. amen. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Amen. Hallelujah. But we have a problem. Excuse me. All things are become new, but we have a problem. My flesh did not get born again. Oh, I have a problem. The resurrected life is a fact. The crucified life is a fact. However, the carnal, the fleshly mind is at enmity with God. It's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. The flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary of one to the other. So I am a spiritual man, and I am a fleshly man. If I didn't have a fleshly man, I wouldn't have to be pressing. I'd be going, glory to God! I'm here! The flesh is gone. I've been changed. This vile body is changed like into his blue, glorious body. Is anybody hearing me? But I'm not there yet. I live down here with a bunch of knuckleheads, and goobers, and sinners, wicked people. Excuse me. 
This is just the biggest goober, knucklehead, or a sinner. Is anybody else in here? I live right here. And Paul says, I, I have a goal. Is anybody hearing me? I don't want to let this control me. I'm pressing toward the mark. Oh, if you would just catch this with me. I'm trying to get it across. Are you still in Philippians? Oh, I don't, let me see what time it is. Oh, I got lots of time. Thank you, Jesus. No, I do. In my clock, I do. I want to show you a verse in Philippians 3. Just a moment. Wait, wait, wait. wait. I got to ask you a question first. Has, has God, or you could say the Holy Spirit, has God ever, like, spoke to your heart? I'm just asking. Now, has God ever spoke to your heart and he's nudging you, prompting you to do something? No, this is, let's be honest. I want you to raise your hand if this is true. If it's not true, don't, don't, don't worry about it. Has the Lord ever prompted you to do something and you did not do it? You disobeyed. Raise your hand high. Keep your hand up. Look around. If someone's by you, don't have your hand up. We got a problem. (laughs) Don't give up. No, 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 no. We live down here in this flesh. Oh, look at verse 15, and I'll try to wrap it up. Here we go. Verse 15. Let us, therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. Now, wait a minute. If you're trying to be perfect, if you're trying to attain, you're pressing, you want to live the resurrected life and the fellowship of his suffering, conformable to his death, you're really, and you're really, you're really working on it. You're trying to say no to the flesh. You're saying, you're dead to me. You're dead to me. You're dead. I'm dead to you. Leave me alone. And you're really doing that. But look what he says. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded, and if in anything ye be otherwise minded. What? What to look up here? Look up here. Look up here. I'm pressing toward the mark for the prize, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And then Paul says, if in anything you be otherwise minded, if something else gets in the way of what you're pressing toward, if anything, I love that. Look at the end of verse 15. Look what he says. God shall reveal even this unto you. Are you hearing me, friend? No. I'm pressing. I'm trying to attain that which I've been apprehended for. I want to know the power of His resurrection. I want to know Him. Oh, yes. I want to be conformable. Is everybody with me? No. And if something interferes, if something gets a hold of my flesh, and I say no to his prompting. The Holy Bible says this. God will reveal even this unto you. Are you hearing me, friend? That's why we preach at you and kick you in the shins and slap you upside the head and say, hey, Bubba, you need to be in church every time the door's open because God's got something he might want to reveal to you. What are you doing? He didn't save you to sit in a pew and do nothing. He didn't save you to stay at home and watch TV or work on the yard. He saved you so he could help you get a t- to know, to know Jesus Christ. In what way that you can know the power of his resurrection? And if any time you're pressing, you're trying real hard, and your flesh, God says, I'll reveal that to you. 
Why would he do that? Because he wants us to keep striving, keep pressing. No, I don't know if you heard it at the beginning, but he's able to subdue all things. I don't know what you're struggling with. God knows. You know. You don't have to be controlled and overwhelmed by what you're struggling with. He's able to subdue all things. He'll reveal it to you. Well, I just don't think he's ever revealed anything to me. Well, Bubba, you need to get born to dependent. Absolutely. People that are saved, God speaks to them. He reveals stuff to them. Now, they can get hard-headed, hard-hearted, and not attend church, and not read their Bible, not be praying, the part of it, and they behave and look and act just like the world. Yeah. But God's not giving up on you. He's able to subdue all things. I just want to say, what a great God. In fact, I've been spreading this around lately. I've been spreading this around. I just want to say, blessed be God. I'm sorry, I'm a trendsetter. I'm trying to get people, instead of saying amen, I'm trying to get them to say, blessed be God. (laughs) It's working. Let's pray and thank Him. Dear God, we love you. Just want to tell you thanks. It's overwhelming. Thank you that you don't give up on us. Thank you that you're able to subdue anything and everything that bothers us, bothers me. Oh, if I just practice it and believe it. God, I pray that we would make the decision to press. To try to attain what you've called us to do. Thank you for what you're doing. We look forward to what you're going to do here with Pastor Brother Folger. The singing, thank you. We want you to be glorified. Jesus we do really look forward to when we get to see you. It's in your holy name I pray. Amen.